Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to Distributed Energy Resources in Wisconsin, Solar and Beyond. I'm Sam Danaisky. I am the Distributed Resources Director with Renew Wisconsin. Uh, I've been with the organization for almost four years now. This is my fourth summit. Um, so really excited to see uh, everyone back uh, in person and really excited to see you all today. So thanks for coming. Um, we're really fortunate today that this breakout session is being sponsored by the Cooliard Solar Foundation. The Cooliard Solar Foundation is a nonprofit organization that promotes the expansion of solar energy through partnerships with renewable energy focused Wisconsin based organizations. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, their goal is to enable other nonprofits across Wisconsin, such as churches and other community organizations, to join in the renewable energy revolution. Here, on behalf of the foundation, is Executive Director Jackie Harrison Jewell, good friend of mine. And she is going to say a few words on what the foundation does and how it helps to advance distributed solar in Wisconsin. Jackie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, as Sam said, my name is Jackie Harrison Jewell. Um, I started as the executive director with the Couillard Solar Foundation uh, last year in October. So since then, we've been um, work. I've been working with the foundation to develop um, uh, a new strategic plan and to you know really look at what we're doing so that we can continue to expand and uh, and continue our our solar for good and solar on schools programs on as long as they're needed. Uh, since 2017, the foundation has supported the installation of over 150 solar projects. Uh, the uh, value of the grants distributed uh, is $1,782,245. Um, and it has actually uh, promoted over $20 million worth of projects being created for nonprofits in the state of Wisconsin. Um, the, those projects uh, add up to 9.2 megawatts, uh, which in this, since, you know, solar in Wisconsin is kind of lagging behind a little bit. And so that is a pretty significant portion of the solar that's here. Obviously, we are hoping that that number will increase dramatically over the years to come. Um, we are very proud uh, to work with uh, Sam at Renew Wisconsin uh, for the Solar for Good project, which uh, deals with nonprofits, any nonprofit uh, in the state that is not a public school. Uh, so we're talking churches, libraries, humane societies, community centers, senior housing, uh, low income housing, any uh, nonprofit group that is interested in getting uh, a grant from the foundation is, is eligible to do so. And we try to serve as many uh, um, organizations that apply as we can. Uh, the other program that we run, Solar on Schools, is administered by MREA, uh, Midwest Renewable Energy Association. Up until very recently, uh, it was uh, run by Amanda Scheinbeck, but she has been uh, poached by the state of Minnesota to run a similar program in Minnesota. So we are actually in the process of looking for someone to run that program as well. Uh, the Solar on Schools prog program, in addition to the grants, um, also provides access to education um, and curriculum support for the schools that participate. So we partner with um, this UW Stevens Point in their K-12 environmental education program, KEEP, um, to help put together a curriculum uh, that the schools can use so that they can incorporate uh, the information um, and access to the solar rate right into their uh, programs so that their students can learn more about renewable energy in general and solar in specific. Um, originally, uh, the Couillard Solar Foundation was developed um, as a single pot of money that was going to run out at some point and be gone. But the impact of these uh, two programs has been significant uh, in Wisconsin. And so last year, the Couillard family, Cal Couillard, Lori, uh, Elise Couillard and Claire um, all decided that it was very important to um, kind of change our focus and go from a fund that would run out to a fund that continues on. So uh, starting this year and with um, 
by hiring me as part of that process, um, we are changing focus and becoming a fundraising organization. So we hope that um, it, many other people will be as excited as we are about the idea of continuing to uh, give access to solar uh, to Wisconsin nonprofits because we feel that by helping uh, nonprofits gain solar, we're sort of helping them uh, in their missions as well. And that covers a wide range of important uh, services for the state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I cannot think of a better sponsor to have for this breakout session uh, than the Trillard Solar Foundation. Uh, nine, over nine megawatts of distributed solar energy responsible through this one foundation alone. So thank you so much again. Um, just wanna remind folks, there is a poll for this breakout session. So please feel free to uh, take a look at that poll, submit your answers to it. It's gonna shape the conversation and how we take things a little bit today. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit, just kind of set the stage, um, you know, distributed energy resources might mean different things to different people. Um, so this is kind of the uh, definition that we're gonna be working with today. Um, you know, decentralized electric generation, uh, relatively small under 10 megawatts and often, but not exclusively behind the meter installation. So again, distributed energy resources can mean a lot of things. Primarily, this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, DERs have really exploded in popularity uh, over the last few years, as you can clearly see. Um, this represents both opportunities though and challenges for our energy bills, for our grid, and, and really for society in general. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that the way we've generated electricity over the last 100 years is going to be changing as we move forward. And the way we consume it is also going to be changing too in the decades to come. And, and, and distributed energy resources are going to be a huge part of that. Um, we've talked about what they are. So we're also going to be, uh, what we're also going to be talking today is about some of the financial benefits to DERs, um, some of the technologies, and also how it can help our resilience and some of our climate change goals as well. So that's a lot to cover. I've already talked too much. Um, thankfully, I have three excellent panelists here that are going to help me uh, talk about all of those things. And first up, we have uh, Katie Molcheski of Sunvest Solar. Next is Emily Swift, Emmy Swift, excuse me, of American Family Insurance. And last but not least, Bridget Geisbers Geisbers from Rupert Melty. And they're each going to talk a little bit about uh, what they do and uh, how it pertains to distributed energy. So there you go, Katie. All right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, my name is Katie Malcheski. I'm a project developer at Sunvest Solar. I've been with the company uh, five years this month, um, and I primarily work on commercial behind the meter projects as well as um, some more uh, smaller distributed utility projects. So Sunvest is a local company based in Pewaukee, Wisconsin. We were established in 2009. We have been the state's largest solar developer for the last six years in a row. Um, we're also part of a family of companies, uh, Newman Land Developments, Tim O'Brien Homes, um, and we all strive to do um, different types of green work. Tim O'Brien Homes builds their homes with uh, Green Star Appliances, Focus on Energy Certified. Um, together, Sunvest, Tim O'Brien, and Newman Land Developments built Wisconsin's first ever net zero electric uh, residential community. So all 34 homes are built to be energy efficient, and they all have solar on them. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and then we do uh, work coast to coast. Our mission is to advance energy independence uh, throughout the entire country. We do this by promoting environmental stewardship, job growth, and education. Um, and of course, we strive to meet the biggest environmental impact possible. And we couldn't do that without um, having excellent partners on hand, such as businesses that are excited to go solar, uh, landowners that are interested in having solar on their land, um, utility companies that have programs that support this mission, um, as well as advocacy groups such as Renew. Um, and then we typically, when we're talking about uh, DERs, distributed energy resources, um, we're talking behind the meter. So one example here is Madison Area Technical College on the left, um, and then in front of the meter installations connected directly to a utilities distribution. Um, this would be one of the Solar Now projects for New Berlin School District. So um, that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. And um, I'll have Emmy take it away. Thank you, 
goodness, I thought that was going to sound really bad. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emily or Emmy Swift. I'll respond to both, um, but I'm from American Family Insurance and I am the sustainability administrator there. So I'm going to take us on a bit of a journey, kind of starting at the 30,000 foot view of our sustainability strategy and then whittle our way down till we see exactly where renewable energy fits in there. Oops, that's the wrong way. Okay, so this on the screen right now is our sustainability and climate action strategy. American Family across the board really aims to be an industry leader across our sector, and that's the financial services sector, and then to also inspire and lead others through our actions in environmental sustainability. That's why my team exists, why I have a job. Um, and within that, we have two main goals of how we plan to do this. The first is through carbon neutrality, and the second is through environmental stewardship. Focusing on carbon neutrality, this goal inhibits all of our initiatives that um, basically the way I described it have a carbon denominator, but everything we do is aligning up to achieve our goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. And American Family Insurance uh, defines carbon neutrality as carbon neutral across all scope one, two, and three emissions. So we just want to be very clear about that, um, which is why you'll see investments, sourcing, um, some and zero waste also, some of our scope three emissions listed underneath there. But within our specific energy footprint, um, our commitment related to renewable energy is that we will power 100% of our own portfolio with renewable electricity. And this is by 2025. This goal is going to be achieved in the most financially and environmentally sustainable manner, and that we plan to partner with our utility providers, nonprofits, and local organizations in order to accomplish this. So that's all I had. We'll answer questions soon. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to kind of take you through a roadmap as well. So I'm Bridget Geisers. Um, I've been with Rupert Milkey for about two years. Um, prior to that, I was with the PSC, more on policy initiatives, and I was an auditor um, that worked on a lot of the rate cases, um, electric rate cases, investor owner cases um, that were filed with the PSC. Um, so during those years, I was mostly involved with pretty much the whole process, um, expert witness testimony experience, um, putting together the revenue requirement, doing the cost of service studies, kind of the whole, all the way from the application to the filing and the hearing and all the way through the process. Um, so what the experience that we brought to Rupert Milky is, is that we are definitely um, more now um, taking that experience, applying it to the, the clients that we have at r &M, and then also providing a lot of that funding experience and background that is really a great time to kind of be dealing with those types of things. Um, and then just some background, I've been in the industry a long time, so um, lots of um, national organizations um, in electric and water. Um, so, and I just kind of wanted to list those right there. Oops. Oops, by the way, sorry. Ah, okay, I'm gonna get this. There we go. So this is just some of the services we do, um, just for your own um, information. And then, um, as far as solar energy, we're mostly working with like more to the siting, the mapping, design, GIS. And then I just kind of wanted to put together two examples of some projects that we have worked on, which was the solar array with um, City of Columbus, and then also with American Family. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, uh, lots to discuss today. Uh, thankfully, as per the result, poll results, um, everyone seems to be mutually interested in all the different topics. <laughs> so we can just <laughs> talk about everything, which is great. Um, so I want to start with financials. And, um, you know, Emmy, I want to ask you this question first. Um, we wouldn't be here today if the costs and the price tides for solar and other renewable energies haven't radically changed. That said, of course, we all know that everything seems to be going up in price these days. Um, and I just want to know, you know, you talked about your entire portfolio going to 100% renewable energy by 2025. That's really soon. And I just want to know, 
how have you prioritized these investments and, and how do you um, sell this to, to the decision makers at, at American Family? Um, great question. So I do want to clarify quickly, just in case there was any miscommunication that not 100% of the renewable energy that we source will be on site by any means. Um, we are looking at VPPAs, PPAs, GPP, whatever acronym you want to throw out there. We're looking at all the options. Um, but when we does come to justifying a purchasing or an investment of an installation on site, we have created a tool internally called the three, the triple P calculator. And so raise of hands, everyone heard of the triple P methodology, people, planet, profit, kind of like backbone to sustainability. Okay. So the idea is that rather than just looking at the profit of a project, we should also look at the people impacts and the planet impacts as well. So for people, we look on a qualitative scale, asking ourselves questions like, will this improve or hinder our employees experience at the campus anyway? Um, a lot of the times we've gotten feedback from our employees that having visible solar on site or other renewable energy actually makes them feel more positive about our company because they can see something that we're doing well, which often with sustainability, you know, it's a lot of times behind the scenes. And so you're not always seeing what great work is going on. So um, that's always a plus in the column. And then also, you know, are there going to be any drawbacks? We know there's always um, the feeling that maybe wind turbines aren't the best for our bird populations or something like that, right? So how could that impact our people or their feelings about this? We take both those qualitative um, approaches, positive and negative. Then we look at the planet impacts. So for planet, we try to translate our planet impacts to financial impacts in an interesting way, actually. We look at the carbon emissions that will be saved from the installment. And then we look at the EU ETS, so the European Union um, emission trading system to look at what a value or a dollar amount would be for the emissions generated. And then we can convert to a dollar savings, assuming that we would have to purchase offsets for that carbon that's being purchased, that's being um, generated if we were going to use a traditional fuel source. And then whatever that savings is or that delta, we translate it to a carbon savings and a financial number there. Um, and then we also look at just a simple payback or ROI on the project. And so the three of those items are each weighed evenly. Um, and we are able to figure out whether a project is in green or red for both people, planet, and profit areas and then get an average outcome. And what this has done is been able to expand the opportunities we have where we would traditionally say no to a project that has like an 11 or 12 year payback period. If we're able to justify these positive planet and people impacts, then that ROI can look a lot more attractive knowing that we're gonna have um, some supplementary benefits throughout the project. Thank you, that was great. Um, uh, Katie, I mean, I think most of the financial benefits around solar are, are somewhat obvious, right? If you, uh, you know, create your own electricity, that's something you don't have to create the utility, but um, it, it, I'm sure it's not that simple, right? And especially if you're a homeowner versus American family, like that's going to look really different, right? So can you kind of walk us through the multiple financial benefits of, of what behind the meter solar can bring? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's right. The, there's a lot to consider when you're looking at the financials of a solar project. Um, for a for-profit entity that can take advantage of the investment tax credit, that has the biggest um, financial impact in terms of reducing your ROI, um, accelerated depreciation as well. Um, we're fortunate enough that we have a very solid program in our state through the Focus on Energy program that has pretty reliable dollars in a, a pool of funding that has historically been available for uh, almost the whole year. Sometimes it does run out, but um, most of the time there is some money to go around for all projects that help to really push those projects over the curve between um, being attractive to an investor and not. Um, now when we talk about nonprofits, schools, municipalities, things like that, um, you don't have the same tax advantages. So they rely much more heavily on those grants, uh, focus on energy. Also the Coolyard Foundation with the solar on schools or solar for good, um, that's been a huge driver. Um, and also a huge promoter, just kind of getting the word out in the community. Um, and then there's other grants that are available through Department of Energy or the Public Service Commission OEI grant. Um, but it's really when you put all those together and then you start to see more and more and more projects coming online, um, there really is this contagion effect um, so that the more people that go solar, it does drive the cost down. So all of those combined really help to, uh, to make an attractive ROI. 
And and speaking of that, I'm wondering, are you able to talk a little bit about like some of the net metering policies and how those make a big difference? Um, you know, there's there's currently a parallel generation docket going on at the Public Service Commission, which might um, have some impact on that. Um, the PSC uh, technical study, there was a PSC technical study, which was uh, released last fall, which showed that um, net metering is, is probably going to be the biggest driver of that. So can you talk a little bit more about, about just how those come into play with ROI and things like that? Yeah, so we, we operate statewide and nationwide, and we're seeing a huge disparity in the number of projects that are being deployed, um, specifically between Alliant Energy Territory that has the lowest net metering policy, it's capped at 20 kW, versus We Energy's territory, which that net metering cap is 300 kW. So the more solar you can install and then bank any excess credits throughout the month, um, the more attractive it's going to be, the less um, you know, excess solar is going out the door at the wholesale rate. So um, that's a huge driver. And then also the, the rate class that the, uh, the customer is on. Um, whether they're paying 13 cents for electricity or five cents for electricity, that's going to have a huge impact on ROI. Um, so those are those are two really big drivers. Um, and then also you have the opportunity for a monthly true up, you know, banking credits throughout the month or annual true up like MG&E, um, where you can bank credits throughout the year. So um, all of those come into play and should be a factor when looking at a, a financial analysis of a solar project. Thanks. Um, that's great. Um, Bridget, uh, speaking of rate, rate cases and rate structures, you used to work at the PSC, which is a lot of what you used to do. Um, the, the one maybe drawback of distributed generation right now is that there's some communities that can't access it, right? And that really affects their return on investment. So I'm wondering, is there a way we can you know, kind of decouple these rate structures from the financial returns? Or is, or is there some other way that we can make distributed energy resources more appealing to wider community, wider ranges of communities? Thanks, Sam. Um, well, the traditional rate making model um, really promotes more like a fixed cost um, to provide a good, um, basically recover your cost based on, you know, what your expenses and revenues are. Um, but when you start thinking about renewables and you're starting to build thinking about solar, there, you got to look at some other programs because you're looking at the generation side of things. Um, and looking at those rate mo models. Um, there's one, you know, maybe there's, it's gonna be more incentives. You know, um, some other states are looking at like, you know, those feed-in tariffs. Wisconsin has some of the more um, incentive programs that we're, we're starting to look at. And that those might be a more, a start to kind of looking at those programs. Um, we wanna also make this really affordable, especially for the low income. Um, and, we already know that they have like a fixed income. Um, so it, even though there's gonna be a payback, it's hard for you, you know them to, what types of programs are out there and how is this gonna make it affordable? Um, one thing that I would say is that if you, it's really two things that we should be looking at would be more as a, more of like a business model where you're talking between the utilities and the policyholders of the current programs that are in place. And if those programs still work, um, to make it more affordable for those low income customers. Um, the other part is really just looking at the infrastructure. You know, we almost have to take a different look at it. Um, we uh, have been functioning more on the fossil fuel side of things. Well, now maybe we need to be looking more from the renewable side of things. This, you know, encouraging the replacement and, and putting in more renewables, but that's gonna change the way that we think about things. Um, so I think it's just continually having those discussions. I think there will be paybacks for like the low income and everybody involved that with, um, with the renewables, but it's changing that way of thinking. Um, I wanna shift the topic a little bit to technology. Um, the, a question that I get asked all the time and it frustrates me to no end is what, what is the new technology that's, that's gonna save us? And, and I always tell people we have that already today, right? We have the, the tools that we can do right now. Uh, we just need more of them. That being said, you know, technology is just expanding so much. Um, and I want to start with you, Katie, and talk about solar and uh, just talk about some of the new, some of the new fun tech that's going on in solar and, and maybe whatever is going around around solar installations as well. Yeah, so when I think about technology, um, you're absolutely right, Sam, that we have it, it's already established, it's proven to work. Um, but I like to think of it kind of like your TVs. Every year they get 
a little bit bigger, uh, a little bit more high tech um, and a little bit cheaper. And we're seeing the exact same thing with solar modules. So, uh, you know, solar modules are incrementally getting more efficient. So you're seeing higher wattage, uh, usually at the same size frame. Um, so we're also seeing bifacial technology and we've been hearing more and more about that over the last couple of years um, where the module not only picks up sunlight from the front, but also some uh, albedo that bounces off the ground and hits the backside as well. Um, in addition to that, we're seeing more and more single axis tracker, which again is nothing new, but now that we're seeing more utilities uh, deploying solar at utility scale, whether it's distribution or transmission level, um, that is really driving the market to see more tracking systems. And think about combining all of those together. You've got higher wattage modules that are collecting solar uh, energy on the front and backside, and it's tracking with the sun. You're really seeing massive soars in the, in the production. Um, so that's huge. In addition to that, um, battery technology, it's also been a buzzword over the last few years. Again, because we're seeing these larger deployments of solar plus storage, um, it's becoming more commonplace. It's also driving down the cost of battery, which makes it more attractive. And then you have this perpetual forward motion. Um, and that's been a big key driver for a lot of different reasons. Um, not only can you, you know, uh, capture your own energy throughout the day, but you're able to deploy it at night which has, it can help the grid itself. It helps to reduce the burden on the grid. So you don't have this massive ramp up of coal power in the evening time when everyone's coming home from work. You can just deploy from a battery that you already have you know, energy within. Um, so that, that's that been really great. Also, if you're on a time of use structure, um, not always in the Wisconsin market, sometimes it's more applicable in other markets that have more aggressive time of use policies. But um, if you can store your own energy and then use it during the times where energy is its most expensive. And then when you have to purchase from the grid, purchase when it's the cheapest, um, that, that can really help to drive that forward. Um, I always like to know what people are actually doing with tech. And so Emmy, I wanna know um, what are some of the cool toys that AmFam has right now that they're, they're using and they're deploying? Well, we haven't done anything quite as cool as what Katie is describing. Um, goals, goals, definitely goals. But we do have the one megawatt rooftop solar installation at our national headquarters, which Bridget, you shared the picture of at the beginning. Um, and I think for a while, we've been outpaced now, but it was the largest rooftop installation in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and there we also have six 1.25 megawatt generators that, um, can, we can take off the grid if we need to, to um, help supply additional energy to other customers from our utility. Um, at our East Regional Building this past year, we also put in our first ground installation of solar. Um, but what I'm really proud of about this unit is, well, it's only 0.2 megawatts, it's not huge. Um, but what I was really excited about is that we used elevated solar, right? So in addition to that, helping protect or be lower maintenance in terms of having to mow under it or have snowfall or anything like that, um, it also allowed us to maintain our restored native prairie underneath it. So we're able to sell, continue to support that ecosystem as well. Um, and then we also have a small little one or less than um, 200 kilowatt rooftop installation in our Eden Prairie, Minnesota office. So outside of state lines, but um, that was our first rooftop installation in 2016. It's part of a lead um, existing building certification. And you have some geothermal as well, right? How could I forget? Yes, we yeah. do have a geothermal heating and cooling unit at the Spark building on East Washington. Um, so I think it's the Sylvie is the theater that's attached to that. I'm not from around here. I should disclaim that, <laughs> Just, um, but that building has a geothermal heating and cooling system in it. Um, and then we're looking at some other for new buildings that we might be building more geothermal um, and a lot of that battery technology buzzword that Katie mentioned. So uh, we talked about more efficient panels, bifacial panels. We talked about batteries, talked about geothermal. Bridget, uh, what are we leaving out? I'm sure there's more cool toys out there, right? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> How about drone technology? You know, we're very, very proud um, at r &M about the work that we've done with, with drones. Um, it's, it's a great way um, to kind of map out your site. Um, there's so much that you can do with drones if you're looking at trying to figure out what where your solar site is gonna be. Um, trying, 
what it does is it gets really, really good resolution, high definition type pictures. So that's gonna help you with a lot of the mapping um, that you can do as well. Um, everything is really um, visible. Um, we can, um, with some of the modern mapping, you, you can pretty much cover about a thousand acres per day. Um, so I guess the, the key is, is that once you have found a site and you're trying to kind of find, you know, and you got the permissions and, and those types of things, and you want to identify kind of like your, you know, the, the drainage, the outlets, the, you know, all the different pieces that go into place. Um, it's just really, really great having some of this detailed technology that you can kind of implement also into your, like your GIS and mapping type programs. I, I could talk about drones all day long, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Um, I, I have one more kind of topic that I want to talk about before we turn it over to the audience for questions, and that is the idea of resilience and climate change. Um, you know, we've seen some pretty major impacts to the grid over the last two or three years: California, Texas, the Northwest, even the Northeast. Um, you know, grid outages due to weather, grid outages due to um, storms, things like that. Um, you know, our society is demanding more and more energy. And as we begin to electrify the transportation sector and the building sector as well, um, that's only going to increase, right? So what I want to talk about now is, um, first, I want to go back to you, Bridget. Um, so clearly, we, we, we need to bolster the grid in, a little, in some ways. And, um, you know, obviously, renewables do have some intermittency issues as well. Um, but can we get to 100% renewable energy as quickly as we need to? I think is the main question that I wanna ask you. Um, I did a little research actually when I was kind of putting this together and it's actually interesting. Um, I found it very interesting that there was five countries that actually are about 90% renewable. However, they're more in the, um, I guess, lower poverty, I guess, countries, which to me kind of shows like, wow, if they can, if their focus is trying to get 100% renewable and they're accomplishing it, we should be able to because we have we have much better resources here than they, they do there. Um, I really think the key to getting there is everybody needs to be on board, but we really need to change our way of thinking. We need to, the focus always was on the fossil fuels. Now the focus needs to be on the renewables, but how are we gonna do that with that being the primary driver. And then kind of as we learn more and as we learn more about the supply and demand, kind of looking one way I thought about it was is if you have renewal, renewables um, and maybe planning more for the backup with renewables being your primary driving force. And I think those are the things that we have to be thinking about and that's, that has to be the initiative. So it's really a change of mindset. Do you think we can have this renewable energy revolution of sorts without distributed energy? That, Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> I think we have to have balance, just like anything with the grid. And I think, I think it'd be hard. I think, I think, I think we need the balance in the grid um, helps. Um, However, as we get to know more about renewables over time, and as we get to technology improves, such as with the battery storage and some of those things, I think that's gonna continuously improve um, the way that we're educated and can proceed forward with some of those things. Um, Katie, I think we've all seen already this morning that solar is pretty much king in Wisconsin right now, at least when it comes to renewables. Um, you know, we're even seeing the utilities develop it on a, on a pretty big scale. And I'm wondering, um, you know, is there any way we can deploy solar fast enough to meet all of our energy needs? I mean, as we all know, especially in January in Wisconsin, there are only so many hours in a day where we can utilize this technology, right? Yeah, absolutely. So my, my theme of the day has been a, you know, we're not going to get to where we need to go by one solution. We need a yes and approach. Um, so you probably all heard about some of these very large solar farms that are going in and whether you love them or hate them, we need those large farms to meet the, the green energy deficit that we're at right now, especially if we're trying to meet our aggressive goals and maybe catch up to our neighbors 
uh, like in Minnesota, I think it was referenced this morning that we are, you know, one gigawatt to their 100 gigawatts. So we've got a long way to go. So we'll need that transmission level. We're also, we need the distribution level uh, utility projects. And we're seeing more and more of those uh, utilities are getting very creative with their programs and their tariffs um, to make it more attractive um, to not only look at behind the meter projects, but distribution level. So um, we're now talking to more landowners about um, one to 10 megawatt projects on their land. So uh, to give a little perspective, that's about seven to 70 acres of land. And when you are seeing those projects kind of scattered all over the state, as opposed to concentrated in one area, that's really going to help uh, help us reach our goals because now you don't have these large infrastructure upgrades. You're not trying to put all of this into one distribution system, um, but rather you can maybe work with an existing distribution system to um, add um, without a significant financial burden. Um, and then still continue to deploy more behind the meter projects on businesses and homes. So um, again, just very much a, a yes and approach. Um, and then in addition to that, we are seeing more community solar gardens. Um, so Alliance Energy, for example, has installed uh, the community solar garden in Fond du Lac. So if you don't have the available land space or roof space, but you still want to uh, contribute or meet certain goals, you can sort of buy into this program. So. We really do need all of these creative solutions to, to get to where we need to go. Um, Emmy, for the last question, I just want to ask you, um, you know, American Family is an insurance provider. I would assume as we continue to see more issues with the grid, more bad storms, more heat waves, more cold snaps, um, this is probably pretty concerning to American Family, right? Um, and so I'm wondering, um, you know, do does American Family have a resiliency plan themselves? And also, do you have, does American Family have a plan to kind of incorporate resiliency plans in, into your own customers as well? That is a great question. Um, so I would say, first off, um, an interesting project that American Family has had going on for the last, honestly, 10 or 12 years um, has been uh, an actual study going on on our campus, which is a roof farm that we have. And this is kind of in relation to climate change in general, studying what materials for roofing and other home products hold up best in more extreme environments, whether that be wind, hail, rain, storm, whatever it is. Um, and so we are able to start to provide incentives to our employees about rebuilding with more sustainable or um, durable materials. Um, one area that I think is really interesting and that's emerging across the entire insurance industry for incentives related to our uh, customers is looking at um, safe driving and the correlation to climate friendly driving. Um, so does anybody here have like a safe driving discount or an incentive on their uh, auto insurance that says like, hey, if you, you know, don't hard brake, or, right? Okay. So there's these new technologies that can go in your car and it can monitor your driving behaviors using AI, using um, also just like sometimes there's actual hardware in your car. Sometimes it's just through an app. But what we can see is there's a really strong correlation between what's considered safe driving and what all these metrics we figured out through like it's safe versus is it environmentally friendly? For example, you keep it below 80, you're, you, you have a better MPG, right? You're not hard braking. You're not stopping all that momentum of your car and you're actually utilizing your fuel and the energy that you've created from your combustion engine or maybe EV if we're lucky um, to the best of its abilities. Um, and there's also, I will say there's a caveat for Tesla here, but there's been other than Tesla, there's a correlation between safe drivers and EV drivers as well. Um, <laughs> Tesla's a little bit of a rogue agent there because you never know who's going to buy this. But, um, but so there's a lot of interesting things that we're seeing from the data perspective and being able to incentivize our customers and drive good behaviors that are both good for the planet and obviously keeping our drivers safe as well. Um, so that's an area that I want to see grow. And if you're interested, Lemonade, I want it, it's probably been about a month now, maybe two, but they recently released a green driving savings program. So again, the safe driving programs, a lot of times you'll earn your savings. So they'll put the money back in your pocket if you drive, drove safely. Lemonade, which is a small um, company based out of New York for insurance, they are very socially conscious. They're registered B Corp. And instead of giving you the money back, they'll actually plant a certain number of trees based on the emissions that you've saved from your good driving behaviors. Um, so it's active in Illinois if you want to look it up, but very cool things going on there. 
All right, we're going to uh, turn it over now to the questions from the audience that we've had in at the app. Um, we've got a couple of questions on community solar, so I'm gonna take this one first. What is the status of the community solar bill in the state? Does the bill introduced last year have a chance of passing given, given that it was Republican sponsored? So who wants to take a policy question? <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm not a policy person, just gonna throw that out there. Um, what I do know, the, the bill has been introduced um, and if we can look to our neighboring states as any sort of benchmark, um, you know, Illinois, Minnesota, um, eventually when you are surrounded by states that have community solar, it seems inevitable. So couldn't say if it's going to be this year or next year or the year after. Um, but it does seem likely. And then also the utilities are already taking on the initiative themselves. So we are seeing some of those community solar gardens. So um, I, I think that we will just end up seeing more in the future, um, depending on how that, that legislation shakes out. I don't really have anything more to add actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of policy questions in this room. Um, what is this? Oh, sorry. I was almost going to read the second one. Uh, what is the current policy in Wisconsin? I think this is probably for Katie uh, for third party financing uh, for direct supplied solar energy. Yeah, so that kind of goes in the same vein as community solar, where um, you know we're we're hearing the conversations, we're hearing the advocacy groups trying to promote third party ownership. Uh, it's not a done deal yet, but again, with other states going in that direction. Um, and they're, you know, the fight is only getting stronger. The voices are getting louder. It does seem inevitable. It's just a matter of when. And uh, I did leave my crystal ball at home, so I can't tell you exactly when that'll happen. I just was saying that that there. I mean, I kind of pretty much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the only thing I was going to say is that I agree with Katie on a lot of those things with the financing and the third party. It's definitely uh, definitely increasing, you know. And we just have to kind of just. Um, there's lots of financing options that are available um, when you start considering that that route. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, Bill, did you want to ask something? Um, this is much too long to type, but we, we have a, a, a project. We again are way in northern Wisconsin, and we don't have any large scale solar up there. The, the biggest is uh, a couple of community solars that are sold out, and the utilities aren't interested in doing any more. So we have a land, 70, 80 acres. It's right next to a substation. The property owner is good to go. We've got a solar a developer uh, that you all know, but I won't say the name that's on board. And so we're engaging with utilities, but we can't get them to bite. Um, so they say, well, we might do it if you can find somebody to buy the energy. So that's the question. Have you ever run into this before and who would buy the energy? Maybe. American family would, or, or <laughs> so we're looking for somebody to buy a lot of energy. Uh, Emmy, I'm sure American family would like to buy some energy, right? And <laughs> not to put you on the spot. Uh, one, that's awesome that you already have made so much progress in getting everyone engaged. And I will just say that American family in general is looking at opportunities similar to that. Um, we have this goal of being 20 or by 2025, 100% renewable electricity at all of our own facilities, right? The challenge is that there's so many long-term contracts that you have to buy into for a certain amount of energy. And I don't know if anyone's heard, but a lot of companies are selling office buildings right now. <laughs> um, a lot of real estate footprints are changing, right? So does it make sense for us as a company to buy into a 20-year PPA agreement saying we'll buy your energy for the next 20 years if we're tied to that utility at that building address and that's kind of the connection there? Um, so one big area or challenge that we're looking at is, um, is there ever going to be an opportunity to generate our own electricity and then sell it back to the grid and buy our own recs back for it so that we can move it throughout our portfolio, kind of acting as our own energy broker, right? These are just like long fever dreams, I'd call it right now. Um, but that's something that we're looking at because of the fact that we don't really know what our energy needs are going to look like for the next 20 years, because everything we thought for the last 20 years has been radically disrupted in the last 24 months. Um, and that's kind of the, the pickle that we're in. <laughs> but I don't know if that answers your question fully, but it is a challenge that's going on. 
All right. Thank you, everyone. We are at time, unfortunately. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, but I really appreciate uh, the great feedback. Um, if you do have questions, you know, certainly reach out to us. Um, I, I feel like I, I'm plugging this app all the time, but um, there's actually ways to make contact with the panelists up here. So please, if you do have follow-up questions, uh, reach out to one of us. Thank you so much.